stubby cross with the altar at one end and the light washing over those white barrel vaulted ceilings gives it an almost Venetian effect whose calm is emphasized by the thin dark cornice line. The sermons from this pulpit, unlike Puritan ones, were mercifully short. This is where the Carters came to worship. The sides of its pews are the highest of any church in America, and this served a double purpose. First, it enabled the Carters to concentrate without distraction upon the word of the Lord coming from the pulpit up there, but secondly, it stopped the lower orders from peering in on them. This society of deference and hierarchy was scoffed at back home by the English. They saw through this wannabe aristocracy and its pretensions, and indeed, the way Virginians pictured themselves was largely a fantasy. In a painting by Justus Engelhardt Kuhn, one of the sons of this oligarchy, Henry Darnell III, is put in an idealized garden landscape probably copied from some European print. All of it is fiction. No American property ever looked like this. The image records the defiant, illusory desire of this colonial gentry to imagine themselves as a full extension of English culture. A young slave gazes at Darnell with submissive adoration like a favorite dog. This genteel surface of hierarchy was stretched over a fabric of brutality supported by slave labor. At Mount Airy, Mrs. Taylor's ancestor, John Taylor, owned 380 slaves, the largest gang in the colony. In the dining room, there hangs a portrait of the master by John Wollaston. I don't think John Taylor up there sat on a veranda and drank too many juleps. Yeah, he looks pretty tough, actually. He looks well, like I a very he was a very it, busy person. He looks like a very self-possessed man. He's all dressed up now, but I don't think he was too dressed up all the time when he was riding over his pl places. I would imagine not. He had to tell people what to do and how to do it. Somebody yeah. had to sh have some brains. And so some Virginians could pursue their ideas of freedom in this newfound land. Realizing freedom, however you defined it, was the basic desire of all these early colonies. And after religion, the second freedom was the liberty to create wealth. And culture followed money, as it always does. As the colonies grew, they grew rich through technology, through trade, in the 18th century, Massachusetts and Pennsylvania swelled in foodstuffs, metals, tea from China, slaves from Africa, rum from the Caribbean, wealth and worldliness. But most of the material culture remained steadfastly English in appearance. While the colonies started to pull away from England, cultural independence didn't come in a rush. It was gradual and signs of it appear by the 1760s like small portents. The first American art that began to lift into real originality was furniture, like this great bureau table in mahogany made by John Townsend in Newport around 1765. It's meant as an image of material splendor, but it's completely unlike anything in the existing English pattern books. It doesn't look or feel like English furniture. The big difference is in what's called the block front, which is basically the stack of drawers sawn from great solid blanks of mahogany bulging out at you. This is why it commands space with the kind of authority that it does. It's almost architectural, and the block front style, as it was called, celebrates really the immense abundance of the American forests, the forests of the New World. This is the delayed Baroque that Puritanism suppressed, rich as architecture, arriving in the middle 18th century, but better late than never. Painting was slower to evolve. But in the Bermuda Group, a portrait of Bishop George Barclay and his family, John Smybert showed how American art might begin to detach itself from its stiff early colonial conventions. 
It manages to set figures in a natural way in space, unifying them with light and air. On the left, a friend takes down the bishop's words of wisdom, for Barclay was a strong believer in American destiny and had written, There shall be sung another golden age, the rise of empire and the arts, not such as Europe breeds in her decay, such as she bred when fresh and young. By the end of the 1760s in the east of America, the tide of religious zeal had ebbed. But the desire for liberty, which had brought so many diverse colonists to these shores, remained. It was so strong that it was a wonder to Europeans, one of whom, a visiting Frenchman named St. John de Crèvecoeur, posed a famous question. Who then, he asked, is this American, this new man? Visit American Visions at PBS Online and further explore the American experience through art at the address on your screen. Over the coming weeks, American Visions continues with the remarkable story of how art has evolved in the drama of American experience. In the eyes of 19th century Americans, the New World, their world, had no ruins or monuments but it had something better, places like this, which proved that God had written the immensity of his designs right here in America. Nature, not culture, was what made Americans American. The Civil War was the world's first great modern war, total and fought at the limits of an expanding technology of railroads, breech loaders, repeating guns and ironclads. It seemed to run of its own accord, a thing with its own will, swallowing the men in blue and grey as a furnace swallows coal. In the end, it killed more than 600,000 young men. It was America's Iliad. It was America's Holocaust. And it changed the country forever. This has to be the most intensely felt image of military commemoration made by an American. O oh, grave, where is thy victory? For me, without exaggeration, this is the most beautiful American house since Jefferson's Monticello. And it becomes so by its play between nature and culture, with those great forms seeming to hover above the elements of nature and yet rooted in them. But the greatest American artist of the 1930s didn't paint collective experience. A solitary, deeply inhibited man, he focused on lonely people in an indifferent world without much social connection. His name, of course, was Edward Hopper. There hasn't been a painter in the 20th century whose work was more associated with the look and feel of a certain kind of America, a basic America that has nothing to do with the rhetoric of patriotism, but goes much deeper. Is it a hypodermic needle? Is it Buck Rogers' spaceship on the launch pad? No, it is the Chrysler Building, commissioned by the Detroit automotive tycoon Walter P. Chrysler as a peon to the cars that made him rich. It's sheathed in polished metal and decorated with emblems of the auto age, gargoyles that are huge radiator caps, and a frieze of hubcaps like solar discs running around the 30th floor. Since the late 70s, Terrell's big project has been to turn a whole crater on the edge of the painted desert in Arizona into a work of art. 
Inside this great volcanic hill, Tyrrell plans tunnels, viewing chambers, and pools acting as lenses of water that will enable the visitor to experience the light of the sun, the moon, and the stars in isolated, concentrated ways. It's an American vision on an epic scale, not just painting the Western landscape, but subtly transforming it.